right? And you can really nerd out on this stuff if you want to. Uh, and then when we get through everything, hopefully at the end of the night, we're going to play a little bit of a game. All right? It's going to be an anatomy game that uh, the IT peers last time played that nobody liked, so we're going to play it again. Because uh -oh. I don't think anybody, I don't think you guys will like it either. But it's really fun, and it's kind of awkward, and it'll get you to know somebody that you don't really know. I love awkward. Yeah. It's not Twister, <laughs> but. <laughs> okay, so for you guys that were here, this will be later on, but they were here on Saturday. Uh, Laura, don't answer. Kaylee and Sean, don't answer. Doyle, don't answer. Test everybody else. What are the five unchanging elements of functional movements? Bhakti just learned them. Core extremities one, absolutely. <laughs> Are you just reading them off your notes? Come into play later on, but midline stability. All right, posterior chain activation, active shoulders, core to extremity movement patterns, and um, range of motion. So keep this in mind as we start talking about these biomechanical things. That in order for us to move, and when we get the joint biomechanics in a little bit, we're looking at all of these things as a coach and making sure that that happens. All right, so first off, what are, or what is biomechanics? A little more. <laughs> how the body moves. Here. We learned last week how muscles fire, muscles contract. Okay, action and myosin, so the protein filaments, they, they pull together, but it doesn't do anything unless it's attached to something. All right, so your muscle can contract all day, but unless it's pulling against something, or pulling something towards something else, it doesn't work. So how our body moves, how we move through space, is uh, by our muscles pulling on bones. Okay, so we have basically two, two types of skeleton we're going to talk about. The first is the axial skeleton. Do you have any idea what the axial skeleton might be? What, is it, what do you think axial is? Axial is like the center. Right, so but probably most important. Right, so we're going to say this is our, uh, our spine basically in that whole spinal system. And then appendicular? Appendages. Appendages, right, everything else. Okay, so the axis is kind of the, the main part, the spinal cord, and then the appendicular stuff is like arms and legs, fingers, toes, stuff like that, okay? So basically, uh, we'll talk about appendicular in a little, or uh, talk about axial in a little bit. We're gonna mainly go focus on the appendicular starting out, kind of how we move individual muscles. We'll talk about uh, spinal stability in a little while, and you guys have all been doing CrossFit for long enough where you know how important that is. And then in our five unchanging elements, like it's paramount that we basically stabilize here so that we can move here. You guys got that? Not too bad. Okay, awesome. Okay, so then what are joints? Don't read it. What are joints? Where your bones meet, right? So, how, let's see if you guys know um, what is a ligament attached? Muscle. Bone to bone. Tendon. Muscle. Muscle to bone. Good. So like in your knee, all right, so you have horrible, horrible feet. <laughs> and then you have your tibia, okay, awesome. So you have basically the, the four ligaments that attach bone to bone. Everybody knows those, those are cruciate ligaments, right? And then your tendons that actually cross the, the joint attach the muscle to the bone, right? Now, uh, for us, for the, for the joint, so this is, so the knee joint, uh, anytime you have an articulation, all right, something that can move potentially, is considered a joint. But there are several types of joints. Uh, the first one is a, is a fibrous joint. So those virtually
absolutely no movement in fibrous joints. All right? We're not so much worried about those in this setting. But so think things like uh, your, the sutures in your cranium. So when you're little, you guys ever like mess with a the baby? They've got soft spots in their head. Their sutures haven't formed up yet. All right. That happened to you. I mean, listen, I've got two kids and I've definitely poked some soft spots a couple times. Like, hey, look! Oh, so weird. Yeah, it dents in and comes back up. Oh. <laughs> right? But now, if I do that, now if I do that, like, it's hard. The, the sutures have, have done this, but the, the definition is they've sutured and now there's hardly any movement there at all. You also have uh, cartilaginous joints. Think of, like, limited motion here, so, like, squishy type stuff. Like, um, huh? Ribs, a bit more like vertebrae type stuff there. So it absorbs a little bit of shock. It doesn't have a whole lot of, of movement to it. And then you have synovial joints, which is mainly what we deal with in here. Everything else. Lots of movement can happen in the synovial joints. Um, usually what you hear when you hear cracking, like knuckles popping, is synovial fluid. All right, inside the joint, just kind of like pulls like a, like little tiny bubbles and it just pops and it comes back into fine. Like there was an old, uh, when I was younger, my grandmother told me, if you crack your knuckles every day, they're gonna swell up, you get arthritis or something like that. Mm. Sorry, Grandma. Not, not Is that quite, not true? Not quite right. You won a Nobel Prize. I thought that. Yeah. No, sorry, Doyle. Just like sitting, just like sitting in front of the TV doesn't really make your eyes go bad, but there's yeah. So like, if you if you do one of this and somebody slaps you in the back, you will stick like that forever. Like, it's a bunch of wild tales like that out there. Everybody knows meth's good for you. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about the the joint motion itself. So how a joint moves is it basically rotates around an axis. All right, so if I'm going to flex my wrist, all right, or flex my hand, okay, it is rotating around an axis. That's how it moves. So what actually happens is muscles cross into my hand over the joint, and I am contracting the muscle across my hand to pull it across the joint. Okay, that's how it basically moves. So you have several types of, um, and we'll just call them uh, types of joints that we're going to use for the synovial joints. Be it uniaxial, so they only move one way. And I'm actually using the example um, of our Vitruvian man, or anatomical position, as my marker for this. So anatomical position is going to be upright, facing forward, arms our arms externally rotated here, I'm seeing just like this. So that's my that's my point. So our uniaxial joints are hinge joints, right? They only move one way. So yeah, elbows and knees. Right, so think about that when it comes to injury in sport. Okay, if my hinge joints only move one way and I get hit from the side, probably not healthy for the joint. Right, same thing when we're squatting, right? So we're squatting and my knees don't move this way, they don't hinge in and out. Right, when you see somebody landing and squatting with a really, really hard turn in on the knee. Right, your knee not supposed to move like that. So you can see it might not be injurious there, but over time it can lead to something pretty bad. Right, so these are uh, usually called hinge joints. Right, what about biaxial? Anybody know what a biaxial joint is? Yeah, wrist, right? You can move your wrist two ways, right? So you can move forward and backward and you can move side to side. So you can flex and extend and ulnar and radial deviate. Shoulder. Next. Next. Ankle and wrist are basic biaxial joints. All right, and then you have multi-axial. This is where a ball and socket comes in. So what are our two ball and socket joints? Shoulder and hip. They've got the greatest range of motion. All right, now, that, and we'll get here in a second, think about now we have a greater range of motion, especially in our shoulder. I've got the most range of motion here. Is that good or bad for stability? Yeah, it could be bad. So we see uh, baseball pitchers a lot of times have because their shoulder goes from a very, very uh, externally rotated position to an internally rotated position really fast because it can, just because it can doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing for them. Lots of shoulder issues that lead to elbow issues with overhand throwers, a little underhand throwers. All right? Um, so the joint moves by rotation around an axis through the tendons. Okay, through the tendons. So they attach muscle to bone and they go around the joints. So, just 
a quick aside here. Uh, most movement involves multiple muscles. All right? I know whenever we do a bicep curl that we have done in here before, right? it just seems like my biceps are the only thing that's working. Right? It is not. Not at all. Right? You, it's really, really difficult to isolate a single movement unless you are uh, electrically stimulating it. And so even if I'm doing a bicep curl, so I even have a five pound plate, right? I've got to hold the weight with something. And even as I'm pulling it up, there's more than one muscle group that's causing that elbow flexion, all right? So we've got a main muscle, all right? So like the agonist of a story, okay, is the main character, okay? The main hero of the, of the movie. So in our example of a bicep curl, all right, the agonist is the main muscle guy doing the most work. So he's what we call the primary mover, right? He does the most work. The, the antagonist, all right, is the exact opposite muscle group. Okay, so if you're, the example I was given in the notes is, uh, well, we'll get in there in a second, but if I'm bicep curling, all right, what is the opposite muscle group? Triceps, right? So the triceps are, are trying to stop that motion from happening. All right, but they also play an important part because they help stabilize the agonist muscle. Example is throwing. Okay, so as my arm comes through and my triceps extends my elbow, all right, and I get to this in range of motion, if I didn't have the antagonist muscle, my biceps, to stop that motion from happening, all right, my elbow would completely snap the other way. All right. Uh, who was the pitcher for the Reds several years ago? A guy named Browning. You see that happen. Granted, his arm breaks, but like it, it was exactly what happens whenever your triceps takes control and your biceps can't stop it. His arm just went snap, and it, yeah, and it went the other way. His bi other so way. his bicep wasn't able to take the power of his tricep. Oh my god! Too many extensions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So imagine wow. now on a squat, right? So I'm standing up, right? Quad dominant to stand up. Hamstrings can't stop me to finish. Huh! Right? Front squat, same thing. Right? It's got to work in in unison. And so that's why we train both sides. We're not like super chest heavy in here. We we'll do some pulling as well. We'll do some quad dominant stuff. Today was definitely a hamstring dominant day. So we balance out agonist antagonist so we're stronger on both sides. Now I was talking to somebody today, and I forgot where I read this, but the the average person has a three to one quadricep strength to hamstring strength ratio. All right? Hmm? Yeah. So there, most people are quad dominant. Okay. We're trying to change that to four to three. All right. Quads, you have more muscle. They should be a little bit stronger. Hamstrings should be a little bit weaker than your your quads. But. My goal with that is to avoid things like hamstring pulls, low back pain down the road, because now I'm always like this, my hips are always open, I can't close them down because I don't have the hamstring strength to do it. Um, I can't run fast because I don't have the hamstring strength. It's just one of those things. If you test anybody, they can probably squat a fairly, amount, a fairly good amount of weight like a beginner, but they can't deadlift at all. Not a lot of hamstring strength whatsoever. Much less clean, something violent. <laughs> Then you have a synergist. Synergist is one of these things that accompanies or assists the agonist in producing force. Okay? One of the best synergist examples I can have is overhead squat. Right? In the overhead squat, barbells up overhead. Okay? My abs are complete synergists in keeping me able to drive force from my legs and keep the bar up. Right? If that doesn't happen, right, I'm in a bad position, I'm going to drop it every single time. In the shoulder, and so in that throwing example, the, the main mover might be the deltoid and the tricep, but all my rotator muscles, those tiny, tiny muscles, are, are the synergist muscles that are going to help stabilize that rotation. All right, does that make sense? Good. So it's important to train full body. That's why we don't do a whole lot of segmented training. All right? So there's not really a, like, a chest day anymore. There's not really a back day anymore for us. We constantly vary the, the stimulus that we give our athletes because we want to train 
agonist, antagonist together, synergist muscles throughout the whole thing. And for us, everything's ground based. If you'll notice, our feet are on the ground most of the time so that we can make our core a synergist. Every movement. Whether it's picking up just the kettlebell to walk it over, you gotta engage some sort of ab muscle to be in synergy with your hamstrings and butt so you can walk across the floor. Right? That's the whole premise for um, barbell based workouts is making your body come to, to synergy basically. All right, Josh, you might not have gotten to this yet in physics, but this is a lever, okay? Awesome, so you have a fulcrum in the middle, you've got a resistance and an effort. So on our bicep curl example, my elbow is the fulcrum, right? A weight that I'm holding is the resistance and the effort comes from the bicep. Okay, that's basically how our uh, entire muscular system operates. Okay, now, there's a lot of debate, of, especially when you start talking about the calf, whether it's considered like a second class lever or a third class lever. I don't care if you know that. Right? It doesn't matter to me that you know what class lever anything is. All I want you to know is how this stuff works and how um, maybe tendon insertion, something that you really can't control, will influence that. But basically, the reason we get stronger is because I've got to create, I'm at a mechanical disadvantage with my muscles. So I've got to create the most efficient pathway so that I can lift the most weight safely. All right, I'm already in mechanical disadvantage. If I'm in a bad position, then I'm gonna create a greater disadvantage for my body to overcome, and it's gonna be that much harder for me to, to progress. All right, interesting fact here. Uh, so this is a very rudimentary elbow drawing. This is the bicep up here. Elbow is the fulcrum, and the, the resistance is here. What we found is due to genetics, there are different lengths of tendon. So somebody's biceps tendon can attach really, really close to the elbow, all right? Those people are gonna move faster, okay? As opposed to somebody whose tendon attaches a little bit further away from the elbow, those people are gonna be stronger. Why is that? Yeah, basic lever work here is if I shorten the distance, if I shorten the distance, the lever has to work. Of course, it's going to be easier to move. All right. So usually, uh, genetics will dictate what you're going to be good at. Kind of like we talked about last week. Think about a power lifter's body versus a sprinter's body. All right. Sprinters can be taller. All right. A little bit taller, lean, but still very muscular. And power lifters are what? like as wide as they are tall, just bigger people, right? Probably a little bit shorter than the average person unless you're the world's strongest man. Those guys are genetic freaks. <laughs> and it's really fun to watch. <laughs> Did you see the video of that? So, Game of Thrones, yeah. anybody? <laughs> the mountain that, yeah, he was a 994 deadlifter the other day. Uh, no, it was a uh, double overhand. <laughs> yeah, double overhand, 994. Yeah, he's a big dude. They don't climb the mountain for his because he's small. That's for sure. So, as a, and as a general rule of thumb, all right, as the force production of a muscle increases, the speed of the actual movement itself goes down, as a general rule, right? It makes sense, right? That should make sense. So as something gets heavier, say I'm back squatting, all right? I might back squat out of the hole at 135 like that, but at 315, it's like, yo! Trying super hard to break, right? That's, everybody works like that. Now, as we coach people, and what we want to train people to do is drive as fast against the bar as they possibly can, right? No matter what they're lifting. Like, if people lift 135 on a deadlift today, and they lift it slow, they're doing themselves a disservice, all right? So they're not maximizing, like, speed, all right? Because when they're lifting 135 slow, imagine they put 315 on the bar, it's gonna be even slower. Okay, so I don't want to have somebody doing 
a 35 second deadlift because it's so heavy, they train slow the whole time, all right? I wanna be able to move fast, and then I wanna be able to move fast, and I want my ideal is to move fast no matter what's on the bar. That's something that's not in the notes that's called um, compensatory acceleration. Exactly what I was talking about. I just didn't want to say it out loud because it's on video. <laughs> so our goal is to move fast no matter what, to, to drive the strength adaptation. The weight should dictate the speed because of this concept. Increase in force, decrease in speed. Assuming good form. Exactly, yeah. Assuming good form. Assuming perfection. Okay. It's what linear? No, it's not. So as a general rule of thumb, general rule, and for most movements, as force goes up, speed goes down. All right? Now, talking about something that's really, really dynamic, like a clean or a snatch, we've seen world record attempts of clean and snatch that are just as fast as you know training weight. So you're talking about something, that, and that's at the world-class level with those guys. But for most of our athletes, and I would say, you know, 90% of the people that you will train in here and in your lifetime, that's going to hold true for most things that we do. That's for and squat. I see here, not quite as fast. Right. So and and the power lifts are also called slow lifts. One purpose. Like they're a lot slower from a just a violent hip extension standpoint than you know, clean extension. You start talking about Olympic stuff, it's like. The amount of force those guys produce in the second pool is ridiculous. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. My question was this stuff, pretty straightforward, right? Basic physics, not too bad. Okay, awesome. So now, here's a question kind of changing gears. What type of muscle, and I'm just gonna go uh, contract, relax, or stretch, produces the most force, or has the potential to produce the most force? Look at your nose. Hey, why? Defend your answer. Huh? Just go like basic microscopic level. All right, so I am stretching my muscle further than it's normally sitting. All right. I'm actually reducing the amount of contact points for actinomycin. Okay. If I am relaxed, okay, and it's in a normal contracted point, it's got the most possible actinomycin contact points. If I'm already contracted, I've limited the number of actinomycin contact points. Again. So this uh, this, this example is why we don't do a whole lot of isometric and static stretching before we lift heavy. Right? If I'm if my goal is to deadlift heavy today, all right, we didn't do a single deadlift stretch before we lifted. Right? It was sprint prep, it was sprint, and it was GHRs. So I'm doing a hamstring contraction. Right? That's priming the muscle for contraction. Now, if I were to stretch that muscle a lot beforehand, you know, they gotta come in and get a good stretch before they work out. I'm actually de, um, not de-strengthening, but I'm not giving my muscle the best shot at producing the most force. Because I'm now taking the contact points of actinomycin and putting them further apart. All right? That's why you don't see sprinters, people that really have like the most maximal contractions ever, doing a whole lot of stretching before they run. Like you might see them in the blocks, they'll do a couple jumps and maybe one of these just out of habit, but they're not doing a pre-run stretch at all. Much less a cold muscle. And we'll talk about that when we start talking about like how to develop workouts and workout plans is, you know, it's a process to the warm-up more. Right, so we have uh, basically three types of muscle contractions for the, that we're concerned with in here. Um, concentric muscle contraction is the contractile force of my effort is greater than the resistance. Right, so when that happens, the joint will close. Makes sense, basic contraction, all right? You have an eccentric muscle contraction when the contractile force 
is less than the uh, the resistance, now the joint opens. All right, basically how you get back from any movement possible. Also, the concept behind uh, negative work in traditional weightlifting. So bench press negative, you'll put more weight than you can push up on the bar, all right, and it'll push you down into a position. It'll lift it back up, push it back down again, all right. Uh, and then you have isometric. Basically, our whole premise behind doing uh, the dead butts and the, the whole isostability work we're doing is to maximize this isometric contraction of our muscles. The tension should be the same. So actually we're able to hold a static position and not have the resistance, which is gravity in most cases, overtake the amount of force I'm producing. So you'll hear the coaching staff whenever we walk by, you guys are doing like pillars or planks or whatever it is, get your butt up in the air because gravity's taken over and it's no longer turning into an isometric movement, all right? Now you're turning into a concentric movement for your abs and an eccentric movement for your back and we don't want that. We want you to be completely isometric the whole time. So trying to match that force up with each other. All right, now kind of getting into the fun stuff, kind of why this all plays together is how the joints move and how the individual joints, we're just gonna look at three sets of joints for the, for the first little bit of tonight. Um, for our spine, all right, most injuries in the spine are lower back in nature, okay? Uh, the, the person has failed to stabilize the midline at some point, or they've gone for range of motion at the violation of one of the other four elements. Okay? We've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in here a whole lot. Like you go for that extra inch or two of range of motion and then you violate one of the other principles, midline stability being the main one, end up tweaking something, kind of pulling something out of the whack. Um, in the NSCA book, it was just saying 85% of, of injuries when it comes to the spine come from uh, L4, L5, S1. So that's like the lower part of your spine. If you're looking at uh, your spine that makes this beautiful S curve, right? So you're looking at right around here, that lumbar region of the spine. So L is lumbar, and then S is actually sacrum, so going into your tailbone. Straight line at the tops of the neck. Yeah, this is the, well, this is my neck, and it's really flat. Uh, I've got a, I've got a flat neck and I've got a flat tailbone. I've gotten uh, x-rays of both of those, it's just weird looking. Um, we, have, we see that a whole lot too though. People have got mild scoliosis, so this would be looking from the side, right? And then if I'm looking at you from the back, and this is what I see, that's gonna be a, tra a training issue. All right, it's really gonna be a training issue. How do you train somebody to load their spine if it's, if it's off center? We'll, we'll, we'll get to special populations coming up because there are definitely some special cases. Even in here, you wouldn't know it because we've kind of talked to them individually about how to how to address certain things. But I've met people that have their entire lumbar spine turn 90 degrees. So they're basically like this, but they're forward in their spine. And they're still walking around. Yeah, it's amazing. What you, compensate, you start compensating for down the road. All right, so uh, how do we in here coach spine safety? What do we say? What do you hear me and Kaylee and Sean say all the time when it comes to? Yeah, that's a good one, tight core. All right, what do we mean by that? What do you mean by tight core? Okay, great buzzwords, fantastic. All right, so I'm glad JT said glutes. All right, for us, it's more than just squeezing my abs tight. Okay, so if, it's, if you're really getting serious into getting the spine stable, you gotta go above it and below it. So the hips are definitely below the spine. Okay, they kind of terminate right there. So in order to get the lower part of my spine really stable, I'm gonna squeeze my butt tight. Remember the two thumb rule from Sunday? All right, so Bakshi brought it up a little bit, uh, a little while ago over there. Uh, if you guys that missed it, for some of our better athletes, we like to, to look when they can't hit lifts or they start to miss certain things, we we'll look at this thing called the two thumb rule as a, as a cause for them not being able to, to do the movements they normally can. What we see a lot of times is, so one of my thumbs is at my solar plexus and the other is at my pubic bone. Okay, so right here, so basically my lumbar spine. 
okay? If I'm in a completely neutral spine position, my butt squeeze nice and tight, and I'm starting my movements, all right, that's what I want. What we see a lot of times is there'll be a break in that positioning that still looks like my glottis, all right, so close my windpipe, this little flap of skin that goes over my windpipe, and I'm gonna pressurize that chamber, all right? When I do that, it kind of puts pressure outward on my entire chest, okay? Now watch people that do this. I would not have somebody that's like prone to high blood pressure do a whole lot of Valsava stuff because it does exert some force on the heart, okay? So it can, you know, make the heart a little wonky if you do it over and over and over again. So what you'll see, people take a big breath, and hold it and then I'll start pressing, the, trying to get the breath out right here. So I'm pressing up against my glottis, but I'm not letting any air escape. All right, now I'm stabilizing my upper back, the back, my upper spine, if you will. All right, that's a technique that we'll actually use a little bit and we kind of do a hybrid of it. We teach a little hybrid of it is that breath is tight through the hardest part of the lift. All right, so I'm down the bottom of a squat. I'm holding my breath still, just imagine that I am. Hold my breath, I finish, get to that sticky point. Woo! Breathe out through the top, all right? Again, hold it, drive that pressure up, stabilize the upper spine, because we see a lot of times in the back squat, it's not necessarily the lower back that gives out, but it's the upper back that rounds forward a lot of times. So I want to stabilize as much as I can there. Now, there are several methods to do that. I'm a fan of like, almost shallow breathing and breathing through the whole thing because I feel like my face doesn't get completely deep red when I do it. But that is a technique that we will use in here. All right? Um, so I hope you guys have all learned at least the past seven weeks why belts aren't necessary. All right? I got, you sent a great email. All right, it's a great email to, to me and Jen the other morning about uh, Baki basically thanked us for making people take belts off. Right? If you got deep ab contraction, deep core control, right, and have the ability to squeeze your butt and pressurize your chest a little bit, do you even need a belt? No, you shouldn't. You really shouldn't. All right, belts are um, it's a great secondary tool, other than your own body. Okay, what you can do with a belt that you can't do without a belt is now I can have something to drive against. So I can press against this belt and it makes me feel like I've created more of tension in that fluid ball. All right, now, me and Kaylee lifted in that power lift meet uh, a couple months ago. Both wore a belt for the squat. It was more of a confidence thing. All right, lifting heavy weight, confidence to put it up, but I'm still making that fluid ball and pushing it out. When people wear belts a lot of times, you'll see crappy form and lumbar loss because they forget they still have to work underneath the belt. All right, so the reason we, did, we took the belts off this whole last seven weeks is to prove to you guys that we can get that strong and have you feel what it feels like to have a tight, solid midline. All right, so we're not gonna violate midline stability. Now, we get belts back on, we're still gonna do dead bugs. All right, we're still gonna do unbelted tempo work. I mean, we're still gonna do that stuff to drive that uh, adaptation in your deep core, but now you have an appreciation for what the belt's actually for, what's, what it's used for. So there are pros and cons. Like, there's a lot of CrossFit coaches that'll be like very anti-belt. You can't use the belts at all no matter what. If it helps you get a better lift, fantastic. If it helps you set a PR, awesome. But it's not needed. Right? I don't know how many guys have pulled heavier deadlifts without a belt than when they had a belt on. I know I did, and that was amazing. I don't have to wear a belt to pull a heavy deadlift. Never thought it was possible. All right, shoulders. They have the most range of motion in the joint, all right? They're also the one that we see in this gym people have the most problem with. Get a beginner to do an overhead squat. No, get one too. One of the hardest movements. Get somebody that walks down the street, that has been in a traditional three sets of 10 gym, overhead squat. <laughs> Can't do it. All right, you can get them to do the movement, like arms up and squat, no, not holding anything at all, but like they're so much prone to injury. Big debate uh, in the CrossFit world about whether or not they teach beginners pivoting pull-ups because of structures in the shoulder. What do you guys think? Let me hear your opinions, not y'all's opinions. 
Yeah. Look at TG Beginner? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why? every single time a beginner learns giving pull-ups. It's active shoulders. They lose their midline first when they learn this gigantic kip. I can get any beginner to do a pull-up in one day, without a doubt. I don't, because I agree the same thing. I think they don't know how to position, and we call it kinesthetic awareness, like what their body is actually doing, and what active feels like. So I'd rather teach you ring rows like strict ring rows, and then lower strict ring rows, and then sort of go on some strict pull-up type stuff, and then slowly incorporate jumping pull-ups where you can kind of catch yourself a little bit with your feet, and then do kip swings. Because now the kip swing, okay, I can feel what active feels like, but this doesn't quite feel right. I want to create some confidence in the tissues themselves. It's easy to teach beginner kipping pull-ups, but at the same time, I think you're setting them up for a less than productive athletic career. You could. Yeah, I mean. Because beginners haven't trained enough of that antagonist, agonist, synergist muscle to be able to withstand those loads. Right? Just like if I'm walking down the street, right? Somebody comes up and whacks me in the knee this way. Okay? I haven't trained, nor do I have the capacity to withstand sheer forces in my joint from elbows and knees. Right? It's gonna snap. Same thing, I haven't trained to do any sort of sheer forcing or any sort of like dropping. And you're looking at like five, six times gravity force in your shoulder. Right, when you're dropping out of a, of a butterfly or a kipping pull-up. They're not ready for that. The muscles are not ready for that, much less the tendons and ligaments. And now you're looking at crossfitters doing pull-ups on multiple days in a row. Your muscles might be recovered, but your tendons take and ligaments take twice to three times as long to recover than your muscles do. So if I'm doing like, okay, Angie on Monday, so we got 100 pull-ups on Monday and like a Murph Tuesday, like, you're oh asking for a lot of trouble. But just imagine somebody with a... Okay, so this is something that you could definitely possibly see. Fran Monday, Nancy Tuesday, all right? And then some sort of some sort of imam pull-up on Wednesday. All right, we didn't pull-up on Tuesday, but I had to stabilize those overhead squats, right, on Nancy. Yeah. So I did pull-ups on Monday for 45, stabilizing those shoulders, not letting those ligaments and tendons relax, then I'm gonna have them do an EMOM pull-up. You've seen that programming before, all right? I know for a fact you have, because I was that stupid at one time. All right, look at our early years of programming. It was like, how can I make these guys hurt the worst and feel like they've got the most bang for the buck? I swear to God. I've made so many mistakes in programming like that that I didn't even think about this stuff. And I knew it. I knew it. Like, we did, you know, like, a hero month. It was like a workout that was 45 minutes long every single day. That was Probably not the best idea. Like, glad we have folks sticking around still. But, guys, I've made all these mistakes so I can talk about them to you guys. And I, I feel pretty confident that we're doing things right now. All right, so we don't teach beginners tipping pull-ups just for the sheer force of them not being ready mechanically. I can teach them, yes. One day, no problem, but I don't want to. Yeah, absolutely. As long as, so, 
as long as you're not getting range of motion despite the other unchanging elements. So when you start having to break that spinal position for that last little bit of handstand push up, but you're a one ab mat just because you're, you're lower, you've lost it. Go back to the two ab mats, get the positioning right, strengthen here first, and then the other range of motion will come down the road. Um, go into knees and elbows, all right? The reason they're so prone to injury too is because they're in between super, super long lever systems, all right? My humerus and my radius and ulnar are fairly long. All right, so there's a lot of wiggle room in here, and it only moves one way. All right, so this joint only moves one way. So my elbows and knees only hinge forward or backward. And so these are especially prone to injury for things like plyometrics. Right? And we do things like bounding across the floor, multiple jumps in a row. All right, or our um, one of our, our workout on Thursday is like heavy back squats into burpee box jumps. So you go heavy load something into a plyometric style movement. Right? If we're allowing as coaches even the slightest bit of, we just call it valgus knee movement, are you changing kind of the angle inside the knee itself? Right? If we're allowing that to happen and the knee doesn't bend that way, we're not doing the best service for our athletes. All right? so, that's why we kind of switched over and we explained it on, on a Sunday too, but switch over to these toes forward squats. Okay, I'm a huge fan of toes forward squats because it makes my knees hinge how they're supposed to hinge. Instead of, and we've seen it, and I know there's been some debate in uh, the Supple Leopard book, you'll see in one of the pictures of uh, the demo girls in there, she's basically here and her knees go like out as hard as they possibly can, all right? I wouldn't teach that and I wouldn't definitely put it in a book to show it as a picture of a proper squat, all right? Remember, that's how we cue. We cue knees out, we don't necessarily want knees out. We cue knees out to get knees straight. Yeah, so I, what they should have explained there, and I, they might have done it, is she's actually trying to spread the floor the whole time and she's got super, super mobile ankles, all right? Diane Foo's the girl in the picture. She's an amazing athlete, amazing Olympic lifter, but she's one of those rare birds. I wouldn't teach somebody to go knees out, but I'll cue them knees out to get knees hinging appropriately. Does that make sense? Okay, awesome. Um, I was going to say something about that too. Uh, so same thing for the elbows that, that the knees are too. Okay, so I don't want, if I'm doing like a, a clean, all right, and I catch and then let my elbows kind of violently come in. Not only am I hurting my elbow potentially, but also my shoulder too. All right, we see a lot of times on pull-ups, because it's so violent and because the lever arm is so long here, you'll see a lot of elbow inflammation because my elbow does when I'm doing pull-ups. Instead of being in that straight hinge fashion, it kind of wiggles a little bit, kind of goes back and forth. So there's gonna be some inflammation there too. So our goal as uh, a coaching staff is to reduce the margin of error for people's movement. Right? That's why we spend so much time teaching the movement and spending time going over lightweight stuff because I want to reduce the amount of bad joint positioning that you have. All right, if I can reduce your margin of error, I'm gonna make you safer when the shit hits the fan. I.e. when intensity comes into play. All right, um, Ali was talking about the workout today. So reverse uh, fan pulls and toast the bar. She said, it was great because you didn't put a clock on it. I felt like I was able to keep in position the whole time with my knees and my hips was able to drive back straight. Had you put a clock on it, you would have seen a lot of turning and running in a bad knee position. All right, had you said three, two, one, go and made it under duress, it would have changed that entire workout. Do you agree, if I did it today, do you agree that would have been like kind of a game changer for that one? Yeah. Bad positioning on the toes bar to get that extra range of motion, extra rep, not really worried so much about the positioning and the concentric contraction. Okay, awesome. So in the back of your notes, some of you have it, some of you don't, so I'll get the ones that have it to kind of spread around for a second. You've got 
how the body moves. So flexion, extension, internal, external rotation, ulnar deviation, or how, how all the joints move. Okay. The little game we're going to play tonight is I'm going to put one person in a position on the floor and I want you guys to use anatomical terms only to get them standing up. All right? So one, see if you can talk the language, and two, see if they understand the language. Yeah? Okay. So, something to help you guys out. We've got basically three planes that we're going to deal with. Okay? Uh, the sagittal plane, okay, is imagine like a piece of glass splitting us in half. It divides us into right and left sides. Okay? A frontal plane, so imagine a piece of glass sliding this way, divides me into front and back. Okay? And a transverse plane, all right, divides me into top and bottom. So you can use those terms. Yeah. Uh, what's that one where they're all on the boat? Ghost ship? When the, like the ghost ship and like the whole like anchor comes across the boat and chops everybody's heads off? Yeah. Transverse plane. Chopping off right there. <laughs> pretty, pretty good. <laughs> Just run the movie. Oh. Hey, in the sixth sense, oh, so you get to the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who wants to be the who wants to be the demo girl or guy? All right, JT's gonna be down on the ground. So I want, JT, I want you to lay on your back. So in uh, anatomical terms, this is called supine. So he's gonna be in a supine position. Right? Anatomical supine position. Good. So hands are out here. All right now, we've got to use only anatomical terms to get JT to stand up. Okay, and he's only allowed to do what you say. So if he violates that, if he moves another joint that he's not supposed to, I'm gonna put him back down. All right, so you gotta be careful with your wording here. All right, let's try it. All right, you guys can all kind of team up on it. <laughs> Out of context, you can all work together to get JP to stand up. Stand up! Like a turkey. <laughs> Ninja roll up and stand! <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get him up like a turkey. For you guys that have the notes, why don't you share some with everybody else? Transversely tighten your muscles. <laughs> <laughs> right? No? No, no. Sean, Sean's not playing. Think like, think flex, extend, things like that. Try to get him from a supine position to standing up. How about sagittal flexion? Right, so what? Right knee. So how's he gonna flex his knee if his hips stay on the ground? I'm already there. I'm flexing. My yeah. Knee. So no, no, no. So flex your knee hard without flexing your hip. Yeah. So actually, you're extending your knee. So flexing his knee will be pushing his heel down, right? Yeah. He's flexing his knee. He's gonna do this, but he can't do that without first Close raising his hip, right? So he has to flex his right hip, and while he's doing that, flex his right knee. Right. Okay, now you got it. Go. Flex your right hip. Nice. Now, go back down. No. You missed his ankle completely. Yeah. Well, you didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> his ankle hurts. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. I can't hear anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Too many Indians. <laughs> Not enough Chiefs. What are you doing? So, movement doesn't tell him anything. He needs flexion extension. Right, he needs to know flexion extension. So now he, he extends. Extend your ankle. Until you And now extend your hip until you can. Extend your hip. Yeah, buddy. So, hey, you guys also, also might need to do like left and right because he could have done the other side and not really know what's going on. Did you do the roll? What? Okay, I'll start up. I can hear you. Go left. Ah. Uh, flex your I call shenanigans. No? Flex your bicep. <laughs> nice. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Okay, so, so time out. What do you want him to do? Other than stand up, I know that. Turkey to get up or How are you going to stand up on his elbow and then, or we could just make his abs? 
legs and bring them all the way up into the sand. <laughs> <back here. laughs> That's a whole lot of stuff. It's like you gotta rotate him around this way. You gotta like. You guys what to do? I mean, one by one, we'll get him there. Okay, but so like, how, how would you stand up if you were a person? The worm. The worm. Yeah, worm. You would stand up. <laughs> okay. okay. I Think about like our over average population. Sit up. You roll over. And sit up. <laughs> I'd roll over. Yeah. Roll probably over. Probably going to roll over, right? Yeah. Or some sort of like rotational get up. He's not going to be able to like <laughs> raise up. <laughs> 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 right. Right. That's a hell of a lot of dead bugs to be able to do that, right? Not a lot of folks can do that. <laughs> like set me like, and like, extend the knee. Right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So yes. who's right. talking? Like okay. Yeah. All right. Keep like, like, yeah. Yeah. How about left, left rotation? Transverse rotation left. Right. Um, you your lower back. You get my lower back. Got your arm. Okay, so so go back to the position here with your with your hip flexing and knee flex foot on the ground. Okay, right here. Now you can do that rotation, right? So now he's going to extend, extend, but while he's doing that, he's got to bring his arm across, flex. right? So when you're talking about coming away from the midline and well, so I'm going to be if you're taking something away from it, what do you do? You abduct it. Abduct it, right? So you abduct. If you bring something to you, add to it. So adduct. Good. So he can ab and adduct his shoulder as well as his hip. Go. <laughs> it's easier with the here. Let me give you some of my notes too. I give you guys this one. To your the left chair. shoulder to your left hand. You're not helping. <laughs> 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 to bring this I, I abducted. Hey, watch that hand there, bud. Abduct your right 13. shoulder transversely across your body. Right shoulder. I don't see it. Add, add oh, I see. Add Add up. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay, allow gravity to take you over. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now you can, uh, you can probably flex okay. his hip. Uh, Let's get his hands on the ground. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good one, Flex your yeah, so. Alright, so flex your right shoulders. Right, right shoulder and right bicep. <laughs> Now, and wrist. now internally yeah. rotate your right shoulder so that your hand goes forward. That'd be my, that'd be my wrist, not my shoulder. Well, your wrist. Wrist will follow. Yeah. yeah. Follow, follow. We got you. I mean, I can't. And right. repeat on the left side. <laughs> Get out. Left side. Quit awesome. moving your head. <laughs> your hair's fine, Jake. Laterally flexing does not count. <laughs> It's uh, internally rotated the shoulder. Yeah, internally rotated the shoulder and on the left side. And shoulder. Good. So, so that was actually that was actually more uh, shoulder extension, two, and a flexor of the elbow. All right, that was two in one. That was good. You did a little retraction. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so now to spring up, like Bruce Lee. Fly adventure push-up. Now. Fly adventure push-up. Standing position. Elbow extension. Yeah. So, so now you can go trunk. You can say trunk two. You can probably say uh, extend your trunk while extending your elbows. Keep your abs engaged. Engage your engage your abs. No give up to a girl plank. <laughs> yeah, no, you can say extend your elbows at this point. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Extend your elbows, good. He would also have to to to, to forward flat or forward extend his shoulders. Now we can bring his foot out yeah, yeah. here. Flex, uh, hip. So flex, flex, right, your right flex hip. the right hip and knee. And uh, extend your right leg. Extend right knee. Extend, extend it. Right. Extend the right leg. Extend the right leg. Oh, he's killing it. Okay, <laughs> rest, 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 rest. <laughs> rest. <laughs> rest. Right. So I'm not gonna go over tonight. It's nine o'clock right now. So you can sit up, JT. That was good. That was fine. All right. The point of that was, if we can't get JT to stand up and use some anatomical terms, we gotta find a new language to talk about. 
you think somebody that's smart like JP and you guys that knows this stuff, that has privy knowledge of it, what about talking to somebody in a workout? I want you to extend your shoulder and uh, rotate, deviate your shoulder. No, it's never gonna happen. <laughs> right, so what we do as coaches, and yeah, it's like we understand the keep it simple principle. All right, well, keep it simple. It's a comma, I'm stupid, I don't wanna do that. But keep it simple. Getting someone to stand up is difficult with having everything you want to do, like, I know what I want you to do, I just can't say it. You gotta find a smart way to say it. Or you gotta find a way that relates to them that they can talk, because using something that's just set and what you might hear me and Kaylee and Sean use in the class might not work for your person you're training. So you gotta find a language that they understand that you can both speak. Right? That's what the magic of coaching is. And it's the ability to practice that and do that that allows us to train hundreds of athletes per day. That Karen might not react to a certain cue, but Laura might. I might say the same thing to Karen, like, oh my god, I'm, just, I'm beating a dead horse with this, she doesn't get it. Kaylee comes in and says something that's exactly the same, the, what I was trying to get across to her, but in a different way, and she gets it. And that's the struggle with us every single day as coaches. You gotta find a language that you and your athlete understand and that you're both happy with. And that they can do what you know they want to do, that you know what they need to do, but now you gotta express it where they can understand it. Hey, I wanted JT to stand up. I know he had to roll over to get into a push-up position, but how do I get him to do that? So using some language that I'm forcing on you is not necessarily the case. All right, you gotta come up with a good language that works for you, honestly. Good, you guys awesome? Good, uh, we had a fairly good group on Sunday. I'm expecting uh, another good group on this Sunday. We will briefly touch on um, overhead squat, just super, super fast. We didn't get to it, kind of ran out of time. I want to keep it to an hour, and then we're going to go into the presses. All right, so we'll go shoulder press, push press, push jerk, and probably split jerk if we can. Right? See you guys at 8 a.m. I'll send you some homework this week, too. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was good. Are we deloading next week? We're deloading next week, yes. Are we at North Atlanta?